Okay, I think we're in business. Ah, good morning, everyone. I'm still recovering from uh, a night of sleep. <laughs> sleep being this thing that uh, we use to kind of renew our senses and uh, renew our groove in life, I guess. But uh, I wanted to talk for a minute about evolution. I guess, you know, the idea that so many of the... <laughs> well, where do I start? I mean... I wanted to cover so many different things, and I know I'm going to forget them all, so I'm just going to just go for it. Um, evolution is one of the most amazing... Evolution is the most amazing thing to me in, in nature, okay? Um, regardless of what's behind it, whether there's a force or a mind or a blueprint behind it, or if it's just all random mutation, it, it matters not. The point being that it's a very awesome thing. And uh, it's sad that creationists and scientists will argue about, cre about this idea of evolution as if it's some sort of a theory still. Um, there is no theory of evolution anymore. I think we finally can get past that. The only thing that's keeping it, the word theory in evolution is creationism, because they're afraid to admit. But some Christians, some creationists have even incorporated the idea of evolution into their beliefs, because they're rational and they're able to say, okay, so I still believe in God, I still believe in, you know, heaven, I still believe in a higher power and a greater purpose to life but that that purpose took longer to form than we thought. That the seven days, when we talk about time and God creating the earth in seven days, it's obviously not seven days, but people still do believe that. And uh, the evidence is overwhelming for evolution. Some of the most amazing things about evolution to me are, um, I, I watched a show the other day that was really, really insightful, and it brought out a lot of points that I hadn't... Uh, I hadn't known about before. You know, everybody, many people have probably heard that some humans are born with gills, and uh, some may think that it's just a, a fluke or, you know, an evolutionary uh, deformity or something. Um, it's in, We're, in fact, fish. We are related to fish directly. If you want to go back in time, we're related to <laughs> the very first bacteria. Um, but fish... <coughs> Here's the most amazing thing to me. If you look at a human embryo, um, uh, you might have heard the, the story that a human embryo looks just like a lizard embryo or a fish embryo, and they do. They look almost identical. It has a tail. In fact, humans actually have what they call these gill pods, or they're gill bumps. And in fish, there's four of them, and they turn into gills in the fish. And in humans, they turn into our throats, our voice box, and our sinuses. So over time, evolution has created new purposes for these particular parts that are within this blueprint. And there are dozens of different things like this, like little features that show up. Um, they were able to find a point where, you know, you can add an extra limb by moving this molecule over to here. There's a point where the human embryo, where all embryos are very susceptible to change, and the only thing that seems to put them in one direction or another is that blueprint. I'm a human, I'm a fish, I'm a lizard. If you follow the human tree back, you know, the funny thing is when people say that, oh, we're related to monkeys or that we evolved from monkeys, that's not true. And this is one of the, one of the difficult things to convey when people are talking about evolution is people say, we evolved from monkeys. No, we didn't. We branched off from monkeys at a time when primates evolved. We are the closest to chimpanzees, but, you know, and that reminds me of a story I just read about, which years ago there was a story about a girl named Baby Faye. It was a baby who needed a heart transplant. The surgeon convinced the parents to let him use a baboon heart to transplant into her. And uh, it only lasted about two weeks, and then she died. When he was asked, why didn't you use a chimpanzee heart instead since it's closer to humans? He said, I hadn't even thought about that. I don't believe in evolution. <laughs> this is coming from a doctor, you know. Wow. You know, a surgeon doing a heart transplant. But to understand 
the closer genetics and what may, it may not have even worked with the chimpanzee heart but anyway we're, when we if you look at corn they say you know a uh, hundred years ago corn was only half the size and we've actually doubled the size of corn through not just genetic manipulation but before that through selective breeding and uh, before that I think the corn today is like 10 times more corn with it than there was in ancient times. And originally that maize was evolved from a grasses, particular types of grasses. So if you can go back through history and find these grasses and these things they evolved from, they can help us to develop better species today. Um, the evolution of MRSA, uh, uh, you know, that, that are resistant to antibiotics, Antibiotic-resistant MRSA is rampant right now in hospitals. I mean, it's scary to even go in there. And it's because of all the antibiotics we've created, and they have evolved quickly because they're smaller, just like the all viruses mutate quickly. So back to humans, some people say, why, why have humans evolved so quickly compared to other animals? And we haven't very much physically. Uh, there are animals who have remained the same throughout millions of years, but humans have changed mostly because as we uh, began to farm, we were able to have more time to do the things we wanted to do, more time to work on our brains, and therefore our evolution is in our brains. And uh, when we look around at the world and see what we've created, it seems like we've just evolved like crazy, but really our brains have evolved quickly. <clears throat> more time for neural network, and the brain takes up most of the power most of the energy of the body so if you think a lot you waste a lot of energy that's kind of a catch-22 of thinkers and philosophers you know, people think sitting around thinking is is a lazy man's job but it's hard <laughs> so uh, anyway the humans have evolved to you know have a capacity for knowledge while some other animals have just remained consistent I read an article about the Cambrian period which was 500 and say 50 million years ago and uh, there's a lot in science being said about whether or not, um, you know, why is evolution, did it have, like, they call it the evolutionary Big Bang. And uh, it actually, five, uh, evolution happened five times faster during that period. Five times faster than it does today. And they ask why, you know, and nobody's quite sure why. It was just an explosion of, of evolution. And, you know, my, I guess I could develop a theory on this. I've always had this theory that there are points in history where the energy of the Earth is conducive to evolution. Or if the environment of the Earth is extremely changing, evolution will take on a quicker rate in order to keep up with that. But once the climate remains consistent and things level out, you know, like humans, we think that we're destroying the planet. We think that, that you know, look at all the things we've created. We're going to destroy ourselves, destroy our Earth. The funny thing is, if you look at the pyramids, in a million years those pyramids are going to be gone. Today they look like they're never going anywhere. The pyramids are the biggest structures that we've really built to show, look who we are, you know. And uh, it'll be the same with all of our garbage dumps. It'll be the same with all of our plastics, all our pollution, all of our radiation. Eventually nature will take back over. And evolution will take on another route. And... Uh, so it's pretty cool to go back and look at a fetus and look at uh, uh, how they develop and which components form into these limbs and to really realize that we are fish. And it got me thinking about the age of Pisces, um, all these particular ages that, that have been attributed or associated with certain times in history, say, this is this great cycle, and I understand the Kali Yuga and the 72,000 year cycles and all these different great cycles within cycles, but I think that there's a greater cycle that we have no clue about, and that cycle is as humans come and go, and the next species comes and goes, you know, what is the next evolutionary step? What is nature working towards, if anything? Now I'm going to leave with this one idea that I just can't seem to get past. It's something that's bothered me for years. The idea that while I believe in evolution 100% as a fact, it's not something I have faith in, it's something that I believe because it's scientifically proven. Um, and yes, you could argue that science is flawed, sure, but there are too many different angles to this. It's not one group or one guy saying evolution is real, it's 
millions of scientists throughout the world saying, look at the evidence I found that humans have gill had gills. Oh, look at the evidence I found that we develop just like fish. Um, and, and if you want to break it down to what the actual scientific evidence, just look at a DNA strand. We're able to look into our DNA and they were able to find out the point why humans can see reds and blues and monkeys can't. Because the monkey was able to see yellow on a screen within the green. He could see yellows and greens, he could not see reds or blues. So if it was a red spot on blue, he couldn't identify it. So what did they do? They injected this particular gene, this dead genetic marker that activated the monkey's gene and allowed him to see red and blue. This may sound like, you know, totally preposterous to some people, like, hey, we shouldn't be messing with evolution, but we have a lot of genetic markers and traits that can be adjusted and can be fixed to make us function better. And there becomes this, this line that people don't want to cross of messing with genetics. I, I could, you know, instantly the first people, a lot of people probably think of GMO products and eating GMO foods and how dangerous that could possibly be. There's no real evidence that GMOs are dangerous, although most people would think that if you're injecting a fish gene into a plant, that could be very harmful. So are we playing God or are we helping ourselves? And that's, that's up to the individual. I'm not going to make an assessment on that. But the way I see it is if we can alter a gene to fix someone's ailment or make them more resistant to a disease or whatnot, um, is that a bad thing? I guess it depends on the situation. Um, but anyway, the one thing that has really always bugged me is during all of this evolution, we ask ourselves, how did these random mutations occur? Because if you believe in a random mutation as being the sole creation of life, you always will run across this idea <coughs> that in order for things to really evolve as much as they have and as perfectly as they have randomly, you have to have a perfect environment. You have to have, uh, it, it would seem that as these Cambrian period, pre-Cambrian period, as these major devastations happened between these ages, uh, there was very little life left on Earth, but all of a sudden it exploded back into these other groups. Uh, it became tons of different animals again and again and again as if no matter how small you got the genetic pool down, it wanted to explode back into something greater. Random mutation to me would take, and, and I've heard this from other scientists as not being an evolutionary scientist myself, I can't say for sure, but they've said that it's preposterous to think that all of this random mutation could happen in such a short period of time, in just millions of years, because it would take so long for, for these complex genes to randomly just mutate and form, unless there was some blueprint behind it, some sort of a purpose or a, a reason, and this is the excuse people use or the reason people use for believing in God or a higher being, and uh, it's the one thing that keeps me believing in the possibility of something greater is the fact that there are these amazing evolutionary traits we've developed, and here we are, these thinking beings. So we can't deny that we're lizards. Yeah, this is where I believe that the old reptilian mind idea comes from, the fact that it's in our genetics, that perhaps some of us may even have more activated genes. Uh, in fact, maybe in the past, if we have reptilian genes, maybe people are born with a deformity where it's actually activated, and some people have had scales. I've, seen, I've heard stories of people who have had tails, scales, weird tongues, things like that. And maybe that's where the stories of reptilians came from. I don't know. But... Uh, you know, maybe there was a race of humans that was more reptilian. Maybe there was one that was more fish, you know. All of it's speculation at this point. But these things happen, and we evolve from these little bacteria. And here you and I are, you know, a billion years later, fulfilling some purpose or just randomly mutated to fill the universe. Well, there's a belief at one time that life just formed randomly on this earth and that it was maybe the only earth out there like it. Now we know that life wants to take hold, it wants to form. It's like the default mode. Mixing these molecules and creating amino acids and proteins, for some reason they come together and they want to form life. And we don't know exactly how it works, but it shows that, you know, panspermia is a possibility. The idea that the universe is full of beings and creatures and uh, it humbles us. You know, and it asks us, where are we going with it? Why does the universe want this? 
or are we just here by chance? Evolution, pretty cool stuff. <laughs> Take care, everybody.